the companies that fully use AI are going to just, it's going to be like Netflix versus Blockbuster all over again. So the people who use the latest technology, which is artificial intelligence versus the old school people who might be just using mobile or the web. And, uh, you know, they're, they're going to die if they don't make the change. We have three technology experts here with us today to reveal what's possible in the next phase of AI. Guys, thanks for coming. Let's dive right in here and discuss what's going on. All right, guys. So until recently, uh, when Chat ChatGPT came along, I think AI was really hard for people to grasp what it even is. Even though that AI has been under development and research for decades, um, so now we can see this initial consumer-facing product in ChatGPT, which is really just uh, anticipates what words are coming next, as you say, James. But what is the next phase of AI? in in terms of uh, assistance uh, and you know we have Siri which is 1.0 what is 2.0 what do you guys see happening in that space well look AI 1.0 is going to keep on going and and keep on improving and what that is is basically what is AI so open AI has become one of the fastest used apps in history with their chat gpt open AI makes AI tools like chat gpt microsoft makes AI tools. Google now is making AI tools. It's a small part of their business, but but they're in it. So that's AI 1.0, the tools and programs and hardware, like the NVIDIA chips and so on, the tools that, that make AI happen, that's AI 1.0. But AI 2.0 is what's really the $15 trillion opportunity. I, I'm not saying that. This is what, you know, uh, Bloomberg and various investment banks that analyze, this is what they say, which is that AI is going to add at least $15 trillion to the economy uh, every year starting, you know, by 2030. So it's growing now in the trillions and, and in a few years to 15 trillion a year uh, AI, you know, boost to the economy. And what is that? It's not the open AIs of the world. It's the John Deere's of the world, which are putting, you know, AI in every tractor to more efficiently um, spray pesticides. It's putting, making the tractors automated driving so that the farmers could do other things that are more productive for the farm. It's, it's IBM helping perfume makers, uh, make, you know, the latest trending perfume in a thousand times faster than the old way of doing it. It's, it's all these tools together. That's going to enhance every industry. It's making new drugs, performing surgery, driving taxis, ordering food, being your personal assistant, Plus, there's going to be many ways to additional ways to make money, not just by buying stocks, but by using AI tools to improve the your efficiency of your business. So that's AI 2.0. So, Chris, recently you were at uh, CES, you and you had seen some products out there that really kind of grabbed your attention. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and uh, and what you see coming forward? Yeah, one of the things that stole the spotlight at CES, which was completely unexpected, was a device called the Rabbit. And uh, we aren't really interested in it as a thing that, um, as a as a thing to invest in, but more of a, a sign of the times, like a harbinger of what's to come. What is most interesting, in my opinion, about the Rabbit is they they use uh, what they call large action models. So they're AI agents with agency. So you talk to this device and it can operate through multiple apps with one voice prompt. So it can you can tell it to order a pizza. You can tell it to uh, post on social media. And if, if your command um, is operating on multiple apps, it can go through all of those apps and perform that function. Um, I think that is a, a, a really big thing. And um, Sam Altman was recently talking about how we're gonna see, it's gonna make small entities more competitive and we're gonna see the first uh, 10 person unicorn within the next couple of years. And the one, the next one person there, he has a little, a uh, poll of tech CEOs who are, have a betting pool on when the next one person uh, unicorn is gonna is gonna hit, and it's all gonna be done because of the like AI agents and this the individual being able to do so much more uh, with so much less and, using and, this technology. 
and think about that, Chris. It's fascinating. Like, I haven't seen the rabbit. I haven't used it, obviously. Uh, but you could see how that could be potentially a 10-person company. The technology, it sounds really amazing and fantastic, but the technology is probably fairly straightforward. Like, let's say I call an Uber to a certain location. All the rabbit has to understand is the speech recognition. You know, whenever James says uh, Uber to the dentist's office, it it knows. I've already pre-programmed it to know, listen to that command. And then when you hear that command, do these steps. And it has links into all the apps on your phone. Like it has an API to all the apps on your phone. And it's able to then open that app and do it. Technology is not that hard. It's just a combination of, of other AI components plus some very simple if then commands from a consumer perspective uh each release of the iphone back in the day started you know 2007 2008 each release got markedly better markedly better now it seems like the biggest advancement and again this is from my perspective not from a technological perspective is they got a better camera right um so my question to you ray is as you know, as the um, smart AI or or the speech AI starts to take more, uh, become more and more prevalent and expected from the consumer, what is a smartphone maker like Apple or Samsung? Uh, what are the chip requirements for something like that? How much more power does it need? Yeah. Uh, or is it plug and play based on the current architecture of the of the smartphone? Well, um, before I answer the question, I think you could look at this is a new interface, right? Uh, we've seen, we've you said Siri 1.0, right? Or Alexa 1.0 or the Google Voice Assistant 1.0. Uh, but if you look at the history of just uh, computing technology, it's like a lot of times it's the interface that opens up a whole new market. So, you know, you go back way back, you know, it was punch cards. That's how you communicated with the machine and printouts. Uh, and then you got, you know, keyboards and... Ma and mouse interfaces and you had the pc boom was in that you know the computer might be very powerful but if it, you can't interact with it and you had the graphical user interface you didn't even have to know command line you use your mouse you click you know um which um steve jobs helped pioneer and, and also um you know microsoft and bill gates and all that so and then we got a major interface upgrade in 07 like you mentioned with the iphone with a very practical touch screen, very sensitive, different ways to interact. You didn't need to carry a lug a whole keyboard around and, you know, painstakingly have to type into it. Um, so we're looking at potentially a whole new interface upgrade, which will whole, uh, drive a whole new device upgrade. And on the hardware side, I mean, makers are already working very hard to be able to uh, build devices that can handle the compute requirements for such a technology. I mean, talking about Apple, they're putting their neural engines in their uh, latest iPhones, uh, and they're putting it in everything, in their iPads, and their MacBooks, you know, everything they make. Um, you know, other companies like Qualcomm, which I think, you know, I think was a, is a really great play on this, because, you know, we've been talking about the NVIDIAs of the world. It's all been the back-end equipment that's used for AI training, but you're going to need AI processing on the end use device, the edge device, which is the way Qualcomm refers to it. And, um, you know, they helped, uh, you know, Qualcomm is one of the foundational companies of the cell phone and smartphone uh, boom. Um, you know, everything from the chips to the, to the wireless technology, uh, each generation we've had. And, um, you know, they're really getting, you know, hugely into designing the, um, AI chips of the future, the ones that are mobile, don't consume a lot of power, efficient, and can handle these inference workloads uh, and do these kinds of things like, you know, not just voice recognition, but uh, the kinds of things you would uh, uh, participate in with a conversational generative AI. Uh, so you could have these kinds of voice interfaces of the future. So it's a different kind of workload from... Um, traditional, more computing, but everybody's working on it. Intel's working on it. I mentioned Qualcomm, Apple, and there are many others. I'm, you know, I'd, I'd be interested, interested to see what ARM Holdings, which is basically almost 100% of the smartphone market, right? It's all uh, ARM uh, chips in there. 
I mean, even Apple licenses their tech for their own um, smartphone chips. I mean, I'd be interested to find out what, what they're working on. They've been a little bit quiet about that from what I can tell. We're talking clearly about the smartphone because everyone has one. Number one, it's it's ubiquitous at this point. Um, are, and it, so what, what kind of limitations do you see on this from a hardware side, guys? I mean, it is, is the iPhone in its current iteration able to manage all the workload of what, let's say, that Rabbit R1, where I can communicate with my phone and it can just go and do things. And when it's done, it will say, just approve this purchase. Like, can it do that sort of thing now? Or is it, is it going to need a, a big a big upgrade? No, the, te the technology, like I was explaining how, how Rabbit probably works, the technology has probably existed for Rabbit in particular for many years. It's really just a, a software issue. And it's not a very complicated, it's not rocket science. It's not a complicated software issue. It's just now using all these different components of AI together to, to create a wearable that's interesting. Always the problem with wearables is, how do you fit, you know, communication like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth? How do you fit all the software into mm -hmm. something as small as a wearable? But there's, there's, that's where the technology has improved, where you know everything gets smaller and smaller. This is sort of Moore's law, but it, even that, it's not that complicated at this point. Yeah, it's it's a convergence of different little pieces of technology um, that are each on their own now good enough to bring this idea to fruition. And, you know, uh, you know, like 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 the iPhone was, you know, it wasn't possible really. Uh, you know, if you go back 10 years before the first one was released, it wasn't possible yet. The the batteries weren't good enough. The chips weren't uh, efficient enough. The touchscreen displays were still science projects. They weren't something ready for a mass uh, consumer market, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's a convergence of all these kinds of different things. And. I don't want to get off on a tangent, but, you know, we've got the uh, Vision Pro having been released. Um, on the meta side of things, you've got actual Ray-Ban Wayfarers, right? But they've got um, some AR stuff built into them. You just wear your glasses and that's super... I mean, we've been seeing the, the pictures of people already uh, today. You yeah. know, it's, it's like we're living in a, a sci-fi novel. They're sitting... They're sitting in the subway or at a Starbucks or something. Everybody's wearing their goggles that they just got, right? Uh, but there's going to be a convergence with that. You know, maybe this form factor will become less important or maybe just sits in your pocket and you just wear something that that has, you know, good fashion sense. Like, I really like James' glasses. Um, you know, <laughs> that's fashionable, but maybe with a little uh, ear input and, you know, a little microphone. And, you know, a heads up display and um, that with eye tracking, which is also getting very advanced vision pro uh, eye tracking is supposed to be incredible. I'll have to demo that one of these days, but um, there's just this, you know, it's going to converge with all this, this other stream of stuff that's happening here in parallel. That's all going to come together and it's going to be an entirely new, you know, ecosystem. So Doug, you made a really interesting point also that, you know, the iPhone came out and every year we'd all buy the upgrade because, oh, they changed the form factor. So it's a little bigger or a little smaller or whatever, or it's a little thinner. Or it's a little lighter. Oh, mm -hmm. they changed, you know, the, the battery is now five hours instead of three hours. Oh, the cameras, you know, 4K instead of 2K and everything got a little better. But now it's good enough. The la laptops, computers for, you know, home computers for most cases and phones it doesn't really it doesn't matter to me if the cameras are a few thousand more pixels uh the form factor they got it right the the speed is what it is uh you know the wi-fi keeps getting better but that you don't need a new iphone for that and the same thing's going to happen with ai the ai functionality is going to get a little better every year it's not going to be the huge leap that maybe chat gpt was that was a significant discovery um, or in, invention, but but the use cases, as Ray's saying, they're going to keep expanding. It's just like, you know, when the iPhone store, when the app store was a year old, it had like 2,000 apps in it, and now it has 2 million apps in it. Like the functionality, AI as a platform is going to keep expanding. It's, it's going to have all sorts of new form factors, like Ray was saying, like it's going to, I kind of think on purpose, the Apple Vision Pro is these, 
kind of like almost heavy design goggles. They probably already know how to do it with just simple glasses, like what, what we're all wearing, but, but they want to kind of have an upgrade path. So, oh, it's goggles. Now it's smaller goggles. Now it's thinner goggles. Now it looks like glasses. So they don't even know nobody knows you're using it and, and so on. So uh, we're going to see the use cases just keep rising and rising. We can't even imagine all the use cases, just like people with the iPhone couldn't imagine Angry Birds. Now they can't imagine, you know, all the apps that we use every day. And same thing's going to happen with AI. It's just going to change all of our lives. In six years, our lives are going to be completely different. It's not like any other technology I've seen. This is going to change everybody. Maybe the web, the, the, the invention of the web is equivalent. I mean, yeah, and look at all the companies that would not exist if this had not come into existence. Um, you know, the Ubers, there would be no Ubers without smartphones. So there's going to be use cases nobody's thought about yet that are going to exploit this. And it's, you know, there's going to be lots of investment opportunity in these things. And, and Ray, to your point, the thing with AI, just like with mobile, just like with web, is that it's so easy and i'll put it in quotes that everyone's going to look at an idea that's making billions and say oh i could have thought of that or i once told my friend about that like the smart refrigerator i could i should have done that because all this technology is easier and easier to not only use but to make applications for and projects for and ai is almost trivial since you can have ai now write the code for your idea you can have ai come up with the idea then write the code for the idea so it's going to be very interesting the next few years. The 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 rate of change is going to be exponential. It sounds yeah. like it's going to be an entrepreneurial explosion if you, the way you yeah. put it, James. Yeah, what I worry about who's going to work at who's going to be a market marketing manager at Procter and Gamble now that you can do all these things with just a little bit of time and effort. And I'm not saying this is a, a panacea of entrepreneurship. There's all the other difficulties of entrepreneurship like marketing, getting customers, managing people managing relationships but certainly the the path to execution is going to be much easier yeah ray used the term convergence earlier and um uh, perhaps it's overused but people would call this the second industrial revolution and um i the first industrial revolution we saw this massive convergence of all of these technologies and we got electrification telecommunication uh, we started flying, we started driving, assembly line manufacturing. So uh, when you get this great convergence, you get a lot of uh, um, unexpected advances. I think I think 50% of it is we don't actually know what's coming, uh, but we know that it's going to be uh, big and it's going to radically transform the economy. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a GPT and I don't mean like chat GPT, like that acronym, I mean, it's a general purpose technology. And when those right. things hit, they touch everything and they change everything. You know, the automobile, the the airplane, the railroad, long distance communications, wireless, um, you know, information technology. These are GPTs that penetrated every corner of everything and made everything just more efficient and better in some way, shape or form. So this is what, this has the potential to do. Yeah, I was going to ask about the convergence as well, because it seems like uh, the Internet has, you know, has borne a lot more of these industries in the last 25 or 30 years than probably people even. I mean, it's just become su such a part of our fabric of our life and our um, uh, economy that people don't even think about it anymore. But now, you know, you know, George Gilder, who we used to uh, spend some time with and, and meet yeah, with. Love George. He, he was um he called Amazon back before this is in the mid 90s. He called Amazon a life extender. And I asked him what he meant by that. And it was the idea that you could save so much time by using a tool like Amazon uh, that it extends your life to do other things that you want to do. And I see a lot of similarities in that period of time, 25 or 30 years ago, and today with what's going on with ChatGP and voice. And if I could just be like, okay, I need to fly to Miami on Tuesday and come back on Friday. I'd like morning flights and have that done for me on command without any additional 
you know, uh, time or energy spent into that, that's going to improve everybody's life. And it's not just flights, hotels, it could be cars, it could be anything. Uh, it just seems like that the we're just now scratching the surface of what AI can actually do for people. Oh, yeah. So let me ask you this. So obviously, we do a lot of research here around uh, technology, especially with the three of you. Let me, uh, where are your attention Where's the attention going now from an investment standpoint? Like what side of the equation? So obviously we've got hardware, we've got people writing software, we have companies being bought up, uh, we have products being made, like you mentioned, v Vision Pro. What ha what aspect, I'm gonna go around the corner, around the, around the room here and ask, what aspect of the uh, new AI 2.0 are you guys most in, uh, interested in? Ray, I'd like to start with you first. Uh, because I know you, you, you recommended Nvidia years ago when it was at five dollars uh, a share, and so you saw something there. So I'm wondering what you're seeing now on that front. Well, yeah, uh, Nvidia is definitely the 500 pound gorilla in the room. Um, I'm looking at alternative hardware a lot. I think um, Nvidia's market dominance; um, those days are numbered. Um, AMD just came out with a very competitive accelerator, uh, very, very comparable in performance to, um, you know, NVIDIA's flagship models, um, I think. And, you know, with the supply issues in the industry and the pricing, I think that's going to be a very attractive uh, alternative to NVIDIA's uh, stuff. And Intel is going to be doing the same thing. We don't have a date yet, but they're, they're going to release their competitor. And, you know, uh, the... Um, the grapevine chat is that it's also going to be in a similar category. Uh, so we're going to see that, that market shift. Um, I think uh, we're going to see open source models become competitive with the, with the big expensive private like open AI and others. Um, I think this is the year yesterday was the year last year was the year where everybody's eyes opened right well the tail end of 2022 and then last year i think this is going to be the year okay this stuff is so cool what are you doing with it what's your use case how you how are you creating value with it how are you making money with it so this is the the year of leading use cases and you guys probably saw a lot of that at ces last uh last month and then i think next year is going to be the year where we start to see a lot of this stuff really start to hit where um, you're going to really feel it in your life one way or another, you know, um, maybe uh, the next iPhone upgrade, maybe a new version of Android, something like that's going to happen where it's going to be much more AI centric, you know, uh, Windows, uh, Microsoft's releasing a new version of Windows or talking about the AI PC. How's that going to change my workflow if, if I'm a Windows user and, and things like that? Very interesting. Okay. So, uh, Chris, I wanted to ask you the same question, and uh, I know you're traveling abroad right now, and you're in a kind of a, a strange, not a strange, spot, an interesting spot in the world. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit in, in being in Honduras, but um, and I'd like to kind of get your sense of which aspect of AI 2.0 that you're um, most interested in or where you see the, the most unique opportunity. Yeah, so real quick, I'm in a, a charter city called Prospera in Honduras, and they're doing a pop-up city, and it's focused on crypto, AI, and longevity. And there's a bunch of players here. Um, and Steve Jobs said, if you want to predict the future, uh, look to the fringes. And this is definitely uh, a, a place to be for that. But a lot of my research has been on the intersection of AI and crypto. So um, AI agents, there's projects working on AI agents, um, and they've been around since 2018. So they've been ahead of the curve. Um, and for you, if you want to create an AI economy, you need to have give them a way to transact. So smart contracts are a pretty natural fit for that. Um, decentralized AI marketplaces. So we have... In our early stage crypto portfolio, we have a, a um, company that is working on allowing different models to train with each other and being able to trans transact and just 
get smarter and kind of make this global brain. Um, fortunately, we caught that one really early and we're up 800% of that. And we think that it's going to just keep going. Um, the last one, and I'm, I'm incredibly bullish on is uh, the AI decentralized infrastructure, like uh, being able to utilize all of this redundant uh, computing power that we have around the world. For example, uh, just the other day, somebody uh, on Twitter was talking about how his, his smart washer was using 3.9 gigabytes a day and he had no idea how that was happening. And that's a that's a lot of uh, computing power. I mean, you could watch Netflix for like three days straight. And um, there's just so much redundant computing power out there that we're not utilizing. And uh, the demand is constantly on the rise. Um, so yeah, um, I'm really excited about those three things and just generally where AI and crypto intersect. Fantastic. Yeah, I didn't know uh, washing machines would use that much that much data to, to wash clothes. I guess mine doesn't. I know mine. I doesn't. think I think he had malware on it where they were um, maybe mining crypto or doing something. Um, yeah. That, well, that now that's a genius idea. Actually, it is a smart. That's a good Ma making everybody who owns a washing machine a miner. Like not only. If you wash clothes, but you're going to make Bitcoin while you're washing clothes. You can incentivize people to do the laundry all day. Yeah. I've got I've got a 20 year old Maytag, guys. That thing's dumb as a rock, but it doesn't break. So and it, and it washes. So yeah, I'm not worried about malware just yet. Yeah, not yet. Next time you buy one, you will. Um, James, how about you? Where where is your attention uh, going in this new phase of AI? Like we're talking about just being able to speak to your phone and get tasks done. I mean, that's really at the core of this, you know, two or three years from now, where, what, what companies do you see that are going to benefit from this movement the most? Well, I mean, everything we're talking about is, is improving. So like to add to Chris's thing with crypto and, and this is a, a, to raise earlier comment about how the hardware is going to have to keep up with the computing demands of AI, like, you know, processing a large language model like ChatGPT, that took three years to make. One and a half of that was using supercomputers to understand and categorize billions and billions of pieces of text. Every book, every written, every Wikipedia page, every blog post, every article. It, it worked for years churning that out to create ChatGPT. That's a lot of computing power. And to Chris's point, what crypto, where crypto meets AI is very interesting because, okay, maybe you don't need a supercomputer working for straight for two years. Maybe you need uh, a million washing machines taking their spare computing power and lending it to itself to this huge parallel processing problem, which is, you know, understanding a large language model. And then you could finish it much faster, like in, in a minutes instead of years. So that, I think that is a, a, you know, AI is the perfect use case for that. And and this decentralized computing idea, which has been around a while, finally has a massive use case. And uh, we're going to see a lot of that. And the crypto is designed for that type of problem. It's more designed for that than it is as a currency, although it's also designed to be a currency. So that's going to be very interesting. And we're following that closely. But really what excites me the most is how this is going to spread throughout the economy. Like, it's not just going to be AI companies that are affected. We've seen, you know, major blue chip companies affected by the rise of the web and mobile. And we're going to say, see the same thing now with, with AI. The companies that fully use AI are going to just, it's going to be like Netflix versus Blockbuster all over again. So the people who use the latest technology, which is artificial intelligence versus the old school people who might be just using mobile or the web. And, uh, you know, they're, they're going to die if they don't make the change. So again, digital, every single company is going to be affected. Digital divide, right? That's uh, there's a people are going to be using it and people that won't. And uh, that's going to be interesting to see play out sort of, um, you know, the people that I mean, there's a digital divide now. Not everybody has broadband. Not everybody can afford a smartphone in the world. Uh, I mean, but, yeah. So sorry to interrupt, Ray, but like here, what do people pay the most for? Everyone always says, oh, I don't need 
too many material goods or, or luxuries or whatever. I'm a simple person. But all those people who say that, I know there's one thing they pay for, which is convenience. Uh, my birds chirping in the background. Uh, why do you go when you're when you're driving on the highway? Why do you stop at a Dairy Queen or 7-Eleven versus the Whole Foods store? Because 7-Eleven is right there on the highway. It's a worse store. It's nobody argues 7-Eleven is a worse store than a Publix or or a Walmart or a Whole Foods or whatever. But you go to the 7-Eleven because you're willing to pay, you willing you want convenience over everything else. And AI is going to make everything more convenient. There's not a say, name me an industry and AI is going to be used to make the industry more convenient and consumer friendly. All right. So I want to wrap this up if I can, guys, unless you have anything that you want to cover. Uh, can you, I'd like to get a pick, a company that you see today that you believe is going to uh, be way better off in two to three years as a result of what's going on in AI 2.0 today. So let's do the same order. Ray, give me your give me your pick that you think is going to be a company for two to three years down the road is going to be much improved. I'm going to have to go with one I mentioned earlier, just top of mind, right? Because I mentioned it, and that would have to be Qualcomm because they'll be enabling a, a lot of this stuff um, on the user end. And if they get it right, they're going to sell a, a ton of chips and probably... You know, knowing that it's Qualcomm, they're going to own a ton, a ton of the intellectual property involved. So even if it's not their chip, they're going to get paid for it. Great. Okay, Qualcomm's on the board. Chris, how about you? Yeah, for me, I would say Akash, which is a decentralized computational uh, network. Um, I just really, I've been following the founder for a long time. Um, I love the team. I love what they're doing. They just opened up for to open up the, for AI computing. Um, it's a more general purpose uh, network too. So you can do basically anything on it that you need computational power for. Um, so yeah, I think that's going to be incredibly useful. And uh, yeah, I love what they're doing. Okay. Akash cryptocurrency, crypto coin is on the on the board. James, how about you? Wrap us up. You know, it's going to be a boring pick and it's one I mentioned earlier, but look, we're here to make money and I could mention maybe the, a much more exciting AI play, but John Deere, symbols DE, AI is going to, and by the way, this is what's going to happen to every company, but I see uh, John Deere aggressively moving into this. Again, people think of it as a boring agricultural tractor company. Meanwhile, they're, they're partnering with companies like SpaceX and so on. And they're adding AI. I mentioned examples earlier, but they're adding AI to every part of their business. The company trades for 10 times earnings, 10 times last year's earnings. Here's what I see happening. And and by the way, the company's consistently gone higher ever since it's been public. Everyone always wants the kind of flashiest companies, but I see this as a two to three X within the next year because people are going to realize, oh, their profits are going way up. So we have to give them a higher multiple. And they're at heart, an AI company now instead of a tractor company. And that's just one example. I could give 30 more like that. But I think this puts, um, what do you call it? Like a floor underneath the stock market as every, even if there's a recession, every company is going to get more profitable because of its switching to AI. So that's well, an exciting thing to me. I, yeah, I think that's a great play. I mean, what is John Deere? Agricultural automation, right? That's the key word. And what is AI? afford improved automation that you can be more productive and more efficient with the same given amount of land uh, you can produce more food more cheaply um and ai is is going to be a big help for that well i think if yeah. you if you were to ask people back when uh, netflix was a boring movie delivery company where you would get these cds delivered to your home in the mail uh, you said that's a boring company. I don't want anything to do with it. And and internet came along, convergence, and they re remade their company. And now they're one of the darlings on Wall Street, one of the magnificent seven. So, uh, John Deere, we'll keep an eye out for it, gentlemen. I want to thank you all uh, for joining uh, joining me here today. I really appreciate your insights into what's going on in AI, and uh, we will certainly be covering this further in. Uh, on this channel, Paradigm Profits channel. If you enjoyed this uh, content, go ahead and click subscribe. 
uh, right below and we'll alert you the next time we have uh, an event posted. So thanks guys very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Take care. Take care.